Hello everyone. It's my honor to have the opportunity to have the KDDM leadership to uh, lead the student paper competition for the second year. It's a really exciting opportunity. The objective of the KDDM student paper competition actually is we want to engage students with our working group and in the format, as we know, to demonstrate their papers, their publications, and interact with our international membership. And uh, in this year's uh, KDDM student paper competition, uh, we start review paper in June after we get the uh, uh, accept notice from, from the EMEA. At the end of the day, I received about 42 candidate KDDM related paper from uh, Dashiang, actually. And after some discussion, we select 12 papers, uh, which is related to KDDM and also is reliable for all student definition. Just uh, to make it clear, because in the AMIA definition, postdoc also can submit a student paper. That's why they send us a lot of paper, but after some uh, discussion, we hope uh, this competition only limited to PhD students, not postdoc. So at the final uh, day, we have the final list is the 12 paper. And also after some discussion, we have the three winners, just see here. And uh, the statistics is just a three divided 42. Actually, the, the winner rate is the 7.1%, which is a very, very high, uh, very high competitor for this, this award, actually. And we have a group of the reviewer to review the paper based on the four things. First is the, whether the paper is novel or not, and also whether it's re related to the knowledge discovery and the data mining. And also the number C is the importance to the field, and also whether they are well-read paper or not. And as I mentioned, they have a three finalists here, so we will have their presentation. I suggest let's follow the sequence in the booklet. Uh, so let's go to the Philip first, and Ray, and Brian. And at the end of the day, uh, we have the sponsorship from the Watson House, and, the C and Gigi will uh, give the award to the first, second, and third place winners. Before the presentation, I want to thank for our reviewers. Basically, we have four reviewers. They have to review 12 papers for each one, and also give a very detailed comments, and then we integrate the four reviewers' uh, opinion together, and then get the final list. So uh, the first speaker, so let's go to the paper presentation now. The first speaker will be Philip from CMU. He will talk about the kidney disease progression. Thank you. The presentation will be seven minutes and with three minutes of question and answer. There we go. Good evening, and thank you for selecting me to present this work. I feel very honored about that. Um, I will speak about insights on the various ways that uh, chronic kidney disease may unfold, and the underlying statistical model that we used um, and which allowed us to identify patient groups that share common disease trajectories. Dwight D. Eisenhower once said, if you, you cannot solve a problem, you have to enlarge it. And if we apply this uh, to chronic diseases, I would argue that we need to extend the view of the specialist and look at the diseases holistically as a complex of intertwined comorbidities and complications. While many chronic diseases, for example, cardiovascular diseases, um, might benefit from such a holistic perspective, in this paper we have looked ex exclusively at uh, chronic kidney disease, and here's the reason why. Today, one in 10 Americans has some form of CKD, with annual costs of chronic kidney disease amounting to th more than 30 billion US dollars a year, which is roughly 10% of Medicare costs. 
following uh, the perspective uh, that we take, we wish to detect different risk groups that share a similar progression of CKD and related uh, complications. And by considering multiple complications at once, and also focusing ourselves on the modeling aspect of it, and not so much on prediction, we contribute to the existing literature. So what's the data that we are using? We have a data set that spans the years 2009 to 2013. And after pre-processing and cleaning up the data, we end up with a cohort of almost 2,000 uh, patients. For these patients, we do have demographic variables, such as age, gender, etc., And we do have 18 quarterly biomarker values, uh, where we look at biomarkers that are significant for the uh, progression of chronic kidney disease and some major complications. For example, track hemoglobin um, for anemia. So you can see all these complications here. So to analyze the data, uh, we use a method called group-based trajectory modeling. And what GBTMs allow us to do is to identify clusters of individuals that follow a similar progression of some outcome over time. And this method, which was first developed in the um, criminological context, has been applied in a, in, clin in a variety of clinical settings as well by now. But in its basic form, the model handles like a single response variable. Um, so in the CKD context, that could be like the EGFR. Um, but what we can do is that this model can be extended to multiple outcomes. And this then allows us to integrate all the other relevant complications of CKD. And so here we build on some prior research by Professor Petman and uh, now use, uh, extend this to five outcome variables. In math mathematical terms, um, GBTMs are uh, mixture models where we have like these we have a mixed K-mixtures and we do have these class memberships uh, probabilities, p p the P's, uh, which we allow using the softmax function to depend on time-stable risk factors. But we also allow for um, time-varying covariates. So here you have to make a simple Gaussian assumption uh, for the likelihood for each of the different outcomes. And um, the mean vector there, uh, the mu, can depend also on time-varying covariates. Although for this study, we've restricted ourselves to just uh, polynomial um, traje trajectories, uh, where, which depend on time. And even as a further restriction, we, uh, only use up to cubic terms. So let me show you some of the results uh, when running this method. Um, we identify eight risk groups for CKD and its complications when using the Bayesian information criterion for model selection. And here on, the, on this plot, you see the CKD progression as a function of time and for the, all the different groups. And you can see here that the first three groups, they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty much stay constant, so we only have like a constant um, polynomial there, um, so the order of the polynomials was also uh, chosen using BIC. Um, but for the lower groups here, we see, clearly see a deterioration um, as time moves on. But remember that this really presents only uh, one piece of the puzzle because it doesn't really give us the full picture because we have all these uh, other five, uh, four biomarkers that we also want to look at. So here's the full picture. On the horizontal axis, you have the different groups, the eight different groups. And on the vertical axis, you have the different biomarkers. In the legend, we see um, which co conditions correspond to the different biomarkers. So for example, see again that hemoglobin uh, corresponds to anemia in the red color-coded uh, row there, and etc. So if we now look at one of these cells, for example, the upper left, uh, in the upper left corner, we see this is group one, and it's uh, in the EGFR weight of patients in that group. And we see that this group uh, has a really a heavy downward trend. So their, um, their C, um, EGFR weight is really deteriorating, and that shows basically that it goes down below 15, so those are patients who end up having renal failure. And the, the color coding here, like in the, of the backgrounds, uh, is another visual aid, so the dark, the, the grayer it is, the worse it gets, and whereas the, if it's white, um, patients in those groups tend to do comparatively well. So we can see here that group eight does well on almost all outcomes except maybe for uh, CO2. 
um, group one is the worst. But what's really interesting are, this, are the groups uh, in between, because in, for these groups we get, get like a much more granular insight than we would if we would just look at one outcome at a time. For example, groups two to four have very similar uh, progression of CKD, but they differ pretty much in, in terms of at least one of the other outcomes there. And now when we have these groups, we also can obviously look at the demographic data and how it differs across these groups. For example, one thing um, we find here is that um, diabetes is a pretty good discriminator between uh, the groups which are more risky and the groups which are less risky. People in the high-risk groups suffering from diabetes pretty much. And whereas, is, um, whereas, for example, hypertension is not discriminatory at all because everyone has it. Um, so, so we can use these to form like risk scores or get different insights into which patients are at risk um, to, and, and then uh, this could help clinicians to um, provide treatment to these uh, at-risk populations. And in fact, we can pretty, with pretty well accuracy, we can predict the group membership already after a year, um, which is pretty encouraging. And we can also do make form these predictions for individuals, so we can right, get their, code, their, fe their features uh, and get their uh, trajectories up to a certain point in time and then predict which group they will end up in. And so as you can see in the plot, again after a few periods already, we can be uh, we are pretty certain how they will do. So to sum up, what's the contribution of this work? This is the first study which applies multi-trajectory modeling to the progression of chronic diseases. And we hope that this model helps in providing an intuitive understanding of the disease progression, um, which then could allow for risk stratification and group profiling for more targeted disease uh, management. So I would like to acknowledge uh, the nephrology practice uh, that we have been working with and thank my advisors. Thank you very much. The second speaker is Ray from the University of Pennsylvania. She will talk about the um, measurement of arrows in EHR based on the association studies. And uh, hello everyone, my name is Ray Duan and I'm a second year PhD student in biostatistics from University of Pennsylvania. And I'm really honored to be here to share with you my work, an empirical study for impacts of measurement errors on EHR-based association studies. Well, we, we all know that the EHR-based um, uh, research has become a really hot topic within these few years, and that is because the electronic data um, has provided us a very unique and important opportunities to identify uh, risk factors in the general population. But before we can use the EHR data into analysis, one important thing that we need to do is the EHR phenotyping. A lot of efforts has been made in this area to develop algorithms that can improve the accuracy of the EHR-based phenotype. However, due to many reasons, the EHR-derived phenotype are often not perfect. But little attention has been paid on studying the uh, impact of this imperfect phenotype on the subsequent analysis. Well, I will use this diagram to show the problem. So in the association study, what we are interested in is this true disease status Y and uh, uh, the relationship between this true disease status Y and the exposure X. This association is often indicated by a, a regression coefficient beta. However, in EHR data, we do not observe the true disease status. Instead, we can only observe the EHR-derived phenotype, Y star. And if you ignore the misclassification and the fit model between this Y star and uh, X, you will get a surrogate association beta, a beta star. And uh, the problem is, can we use this beta star to approximate the true beta? And what are the statistical issues for doing that? Well, for EHR-based phenotyping, some of the algorithms actually perform very well, and they have a positive predict value above 90%. However, some of the algorithms do not perform quite well due to reasons such as the disease is more difficult to classify than others. For example, um, the rheumatoid arthritis is more difficult to classify compared to type 2 diabetes. 
And uh, another reason may be the lack of portability. And moreover, there are situations that the exposure status X in the association study also needs to be obtained from the EHR algorithm, such as the smoking status. So we are interested in, among all of these three situations, can we ignore the misclassification and treat the uh, EHR-derived phenotype as the true disease status in association studies? And if not, what are the consequences for doing that? So our study mainly focused on the investigating the imperfect phenotype on the, uh, on the statistical powers of association study. And to do that, we are trying to mimic two major types of studies. One is the GWA study and the other is the EPI study. The main difference between these two different uh, types of study is that in the GWA setting, the covariate is a genotype and which is often considered as accurate. So in this setting, we will only have the outcome misclassification. And in the EPI setting, both the outcome and the covariate will have certain amount of misclassification. And besides that, we consider multiple situations, such as the common disease situation versus a rare disease situation, a low misclassification rate for the outcome versus a high misclassification rate for the outcome, or a small versus large amount of measurement errors for the covariates. And since we consider a lot of different scenarios, due to the limit of time, I will just show you the results from one of the scenarios for illustration. So this is the um, simulation results for, for the EPI settings for the covariate of smoking status. The x-axis here is the effect size, and the y-axis is the power. Since we have two different levels for the outcome misclassification and two different levels for the covariate misclassification, so in total we have um, four different misclassified scenario showed here in dashed lines in different colors. And the right solid line stands for the gold standard situation where we use the true outcome and exposure in our study. So if we compare the red line and the blue line, the top two lines, we see that the maximum power loss is up to 25%. This is actually corresponding to the situation where both the algorithms for the outcome and exposure work well. But when one of the algorithms does not perform well, the power loss is huge. And another way to understand this power loss is that in association study, people usually expect their study, uh, statistical power to be greater than 80%. So if you think that there is no misclassification of the outcome, this is a power you actually need. But due to the misclassification, these are the powers that you actually got. That means when both of the outcome works pretty well, the, the actual power you get is around 55%. However, when one of the algorithms does not perform well, your statistical power is under 30%. So I think this result is very important in the sense that from a study design point of view, the sample size based on the true disease status and the true exposure status is not able to guarantee the statistical power that you need. In reality, if we can get the misclassification rate from, for example, a validation sample, then the correct sample size can be obtained through a similar simulation study as our study. And uh, also for hypothesis testing, I think we need to develop methods that could account for this phenotyping error while improving the statistical power. And uh, for estimation, it has been proved that when there are misclassifications for the outcome and exposure, the bias of the association estimation will be, uh, will be um, the, the estimation of the association will be biased. So our group is actually working on developing methods that could do the bias correction. And we already have some very exciting results that we would like to share with you in the future. Well, thank you all for your time. Any question for Louis?
question. So I have a question is, is have you implemented the algorithm or I re read your paper, it seems like you have some implementation in the invoice system. Um, no, actually this is a um, simulation study. We, we don't have like real data for that, um, but we, uh, the, the parameter that we choose in our study, for example, the sensitivity and specificity and the disease prevalence are all from the like, real published papers just to try to mimic the real situation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please the speaker to the Brian. Uh, he is from Vanderbilt University and uh, he will talk about his research on social, work, social network analytics on cancer provide collaboration. Thank you. So I'd like to start off by thanking the KD, KDDM Working Group for allowing, allowing me to present some work I've been very excited about, um, looking at social network analysis of cancer provider collaboration. So as we know, cancer management is very complex, and that the physicians ha or the patients uh, visit multiple physicians over an extended period of time, and these physicians are often in multiple locations. Um, so it's a large burden for the patients. Now, a, a previous study found that cancer patients see an average of 32 physicians over the course of their treatments. Um, so with this many physicians, the effective, manage, effective management of care is very integral to delivering a high, a high quality of care. So cancer care is also very expensive. Um, and now the medical cost of cancer care is expected to be $158 billion by 2020. Now this, this amount is also compounded by the lost productivity due to cancer being nearly $148 billion um, in that same time period. Uh, so we see that this is a major burden for those, for those patients who are incurring all these treatments. So uh, patients who receive care from a more highly connected group of physicians often have lower costs. This is often due to the, um, the reduction in unnecessary services um, and just an overall more comprehensive uh, group of care. So we looked at tumor registry data from 2000 to 2015 and included providers who treated patients with stage one through stage three breast cancer. Now, we wanted to focus our analysis on those providers who uh, were strictly um, providing the cancer care rather than um, primary care or care and some of the other um, some of the other problems that the patient might have. So we only included the medical oncologist, surgical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist. Now, our data set included patient demographics, treatment summaries, and provider characteristics. So we first started out by creating network visualizations. Um, now, initially, this was a, a node edge graph or social network, um, with the nodes being those providers who treated the patients, and an edge representing a, a connection or a shared patient between two providers. Uh, we formatted the node and edge sizes, so the node sizes were based on the total number of, of patients um, who were cared for by one particular provider, um, and the edge sizes were weighted, um, and the edge thickness by the number of shared patients between a provider pair. And then finally, we decided to color the nodes uh, so that we could um, look at the specialty distributions uh, within each particular network. So briefly, our full network statistics. Uh, we have 3,924 patients. Uh, now, the majority of those patients were in stage one, um, with the fewest patients having the stage three uh, breast cancer. There were 409 providers uh, who had 1,758 relationships. Now, each provider had an average of 20.8 patients, or treated an average of 20.8 patients, and provider pairs shared an average of 3.7 patients. Now, here we're looking at the ratios of providers to patients, which we use to represent the relative size of the network, um, and the ratio of edges to patients, which represents the relative connectivity of that network. Now, in all three stages, we see that as stage increases, both of the ratios increase, um, signaling a, an increase in connectivity, uh, which makes sense because as the intensity of treatment um, for some of these higher stages, it there requires a closer collaboration between these 
um, cancer providers and the physicians. Now looking at the top providers of each specialty, uh, we see that the top radio radiation oncologist clearly dominates the network, treating nearly 56% of the patients who received radiation oncology care um, over our time period. Um, however, in all three specialties, the top five providers uh, treated the vast majority of patients uh, for all three specialties. Now, looking at the relationships between the Vanderbilt providers, uh, we see that looking at the percent of raw edges in the network, uh, all three specialties are relatively low um, compared to the percent of weighted edges, uh, where we see over 70 percent uh, in all three specialties. Uh, so this signifies that a lot of these patients are receiving uh, the majority of, of their care, or a lot of the Vanderbilt providers are treating, um, treating these patients, which, which we would expect um, since we're using the Vanderbilt Tumor Registry. Now we see, looking at the relationships between the Vanderbilt providers, 79% of the relationship shared, over two, shared at least two patients while 60% of the relationship shared at least three patients. Now, previous work I found that um, looking at stage three colon cancer patients, that providers who treated and shared at least two patients between um, provider pairs had better outcomes. Uh, so we find that this is a, pr a fairly good statistic for the Vanderbilt community uh, as a whole, um, especially since we're looking at a static data, static data set over a 15 year period. So a brief discussion, um, now we've introduced a scalable approach using tumor registry data. And this is scalable in two ways. So first, the tumor registry data um, is a nationally identified format uh, which, which can be, um, which is, this analysis can be transferred to any site or any institution using that similar format. Um, and then also, it's scalable in that tumor registries hold hold data for many different cancer types. So while we've used breast cancer here uh, for the study, the, a similar study could be conducted on any form of cancer. Now we've also have a metric to evaluate, um, a quantitative metric to evaluate care coordination, uh, which is important because we're able to um, compare this coordination between sites. We can look at uh, different treatment between uh, cancer stages in order to optimize uh, care coordination and care teams. Um, in these diseases. Uh, now, a current limitation, we have, it's, we do have a static snapshot of an inherently dynamic system. So, 15 years of data, we, we do realize that providers enter and exit the network. Um, and so this is definitely something we're looking to, to work on in some of our continued studies. Now, a few future directions. These numbers here are one year of data points in Vanderbilt's electronic medical record. And all of these really hold a, a very interesting story to collaboration and care coordination as a whole. Uh, so this is an, another avenue we're looking to leverage um, to get a more holistic model of provider collaboration. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Mia Levy, uh, and Dr. Jeremy Warner, who helped me navigate the tumor registry. Uh, the Vanderbilt DBMI students and staff, and I'm funded by the NLN Training Grant, um, National Library of Medicine. Thank you.